He'd been given every advantage in the world, far beyond most kids born in the ghetto, but he still feels like he's been somehow cheated or robbed by me. It's a scenario I never imagined I'd find myself in with my firstborn child. But here we are. Entitlement creates resentment. There have been a lot of disappointing moments in my relationship with Marquise over the past few years. But the lowest was when I saw him post a picture of himself with Kyle McGriff, the son of Kenneth Supreme McGriff. Without rehashing too much bad history, Kenneth McGriff was one of the biggest drug dealers in Queens and the man the authorities believed was behind the attempt on my life. So by posing with his son, Marquise was basically co-signing the individual who might have tried to have his father killed. I had known Marquise resented me for a while, but I never imagined he would hate me so much that he'd allow himself to be used as a prop by my enemy. Someone recently sent me a quote from Benjamin Franklin that really resonated with me. Franklin's son had sided with the British in the Revolutionary War, despite the fact that his father was one of the leaders of the Revolution. It messed with Ben Franklin for the rest of his life. He wrote, Nothing has ever hurt me so much and affected me with such keen sensation as to find myself deserted in my old age by my only son, and not only deserted, but to find him taking up arms against me and a cause wherein my good fame, fortune, and life were all at stake. Marquise might not have been literally taking up arms against me, but he was standing next to the son of someone who might have. I could recognize Franklin's pain. I spent a lot of time searching my soul, trying to understand what can make a son forsake his father like that. I've tried to put myself in Marquise's shoes. Just as he doesn't know what it's like to grow up under the circumstances I did, I don't know what it was like to grow up as the son of 50 Cent. Certainly on the surface, he had everything he wanted. But there must have been pressures and insecurities from being my son that I can't identify with. I accept that. I still can't see how those pressures and insecurities would force a child to go against his own father, especially a father who has provided everything for him. As I go over our relationship in my mind, the only answer that I can come up with is that I actually might have done too much for Marquise. How do you make a privileged child feel deprived or angry? I guess by getting him whatever he wants. Like many kids from his generation, Marquise has always been into sneakers. Because he's my son, he couldn't just rock any old sneakers either. If a new pair of Jordans came out, he had to have them right away. If Marquise asked for a pair of Jordans on Monday, his mother would make sure they were on his feet by Tuesday. It still didn't make him happy. Instead of being excited to rock his new pair of Jordans, all Marquise could think about was all of the retro Jordans he didn't have, all the different flyways and colors that weren't in his closet. When he should have felt gratification, all he really felt was disappointment. I could not relate. The kid didn't have a job, but somehow wanted to collect $300 sneakers and then still felt unhappy when he actually got them? His entire mindset was alien to me. I have to believe his mother was behind his disappointment. He thought he could have every sneaker ever made, even though he hadn't actually earned any of them. He's not regular, she would tell me when I asked why he needed another new pair. He's your son. She had already established a pattern that you didn't have to work for something to get it. Marquise was just following her lead. I didn't want that sense of entitlement to become a core part of who he was. I was determined to help him learn that he would actually be much happier when he worked for the things he wanted, that their value would increase exponentially. One day I was driving through Harlem when I noticed that a sneaker store was going out of business on 125th Street. My mind immediately flashed to my son. Marquise loves sneakers. So I pulled over to see if I can grab him a couple of pairs on the cheap. Being naturally inquisitive, I asked the owner why he was going out of business if sneakers were so hot. He explained that he picked the wrong location and never got enough foot traffic to make it work. My mind started clicking. Say, how much do you pay for a pair of Air Force Ones, I asked. About 40 bucks, he told me. And how much you sell them for? About 80 bucks. That seemed like a pretty solid profit margin to me. What are you going to do with all these Air Forces now, I asked. I don't know, he said. Probably just stash them in my basement till I figure out my next move. I tell you what I told him. I'm going to buy the rest of the inventory from you right now at cost. The guy jumped at my offer. Suddenly, I was the new owner of a couple hundred pairs of Nikes. I hatched the plan. Marquise was in Atlanta, where I knew storage space was cheap. I would ship the sneakers down to him, 
where he could put them in a warehouse instead of opening up a brick-and-mortar shop, which would have taken a lot of investment, and depended on foot traffic, he could set up an internet site selling sneakers, what is referred to as direct-to-consumer sales. All it would require would be for him to run the site and maybe hire a friend to manage the warehouse side of things. The idea felt like a winner. As soon as I left the shop, I called up my son. Yo, Marquise, you know how you always been fascinated with shoes? I asked. Well, I just figured out a way you can afford them yourself and start to earn a little money of your own, too. I broke down the whole plan for him. I explained how it was a great opportunity that would not only support his passion, but allow him to get a nuts and bolts understanding of how business works. This is a layup, I told him. Not too many stores get to start off with free inventory. You could really do something with this. If you're truly passionate about sneakers, this is the time to show it. Marquis said all the right things on the phone how excited he was and how it sounded like a great opportunity. So I had the shoes shipped down to Atlanta. Then I never heard from him about it again. Weeks, then months passed. Finally, one day, his mother called me and announced that she and Marquis been talking. Instead of an online sneaker store, they wanted to open a clothing boutique in Atlanta. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The plan I envisioned didn't include her. I wanted our son to learn how to be responsible for himself. By injecting herself into the mix, she was just trying to keep him a boy a little longer. I still wanted Marquise to get some experience, so I said, sure, let me know when you guys want to do something. But of course, their boutique never went anywhere. And the online sneaker shop didn't either. My issue with Marquise wasn't that he wanted all those sneakers. When I was a kid, I wanted sneakers too. The difference is that I was willing, no, make that determined, to do the work necessary to obtain them. I wouldn't for a second want Marquise to have to resort to the type of work I put in to get my kicks. At the time, I perceived selling drugs as the only viable option in my environment, so I pursued it. Marquise has so many more options in front of him than I ever had. I just needed to see him pick one and put in the work. There's nothing wrong with wanting things. The sense of want can be a tremendous motivation tool. Feeling like you want more than what you have is what keeps us from getting complacent. I've pretty much got it all, but I never feel like I do. When I was younger, I always wanted more in the way of material things. Today, what I want more of is validation. No matter how many awards, accolades, or headlines I get, it's never enough. I'm still obsessed with feeling like I've got the hottest show or just dropped the hottest verse. Needing the respect of my peers and confirmation of sales is what keep me pushing forward. I need to feel like they're looking at me and saying, man, 50 did it again. That's what gets me high. What sets me apart is I never expect anyone else to bring me those accolades. I go out each and every day obsessed with putting in the work that will earn me whatever sort of validation I'm looking for. When it comes to Marquise's approach with dealing with wanting something, the apple fell from the tree and kept rolling and rolling. Sure, Marquise never following up on the sneakers might seem like a small thing, the type of irresponsibility and lack of initiative teenagers and young adults display all the time, but it was a huge disappointment to me. Forget about being able to afford his personal sneaker collection. That online store could have ended up making us both a killing. We had that conversation years ago. Since then, online sneaker sites have become incredibly lucrative. Goat.com is valued at $550 million, while StockX.com has a billion-dollar valuation. If Marquise had followed through on what we talked about, he could have been included in that conversation. He could be independently rich. Shit, he might be in a position to tell me to go fuck myself and my money if that's what he wanted to do. I'm sure when Marquise reads about GOAT or StockX, deep down he probably realizes I was right. Maybe he says, why did I not listen to my father and start that fucking online shop? Or maybe he can't bring himself to say that. I don't think he's accepted that no matter all our ups and downs, I still have his best interest at heart. There's nothing that would make me feel better than to see him blossom. No Grammy, no Emmy, no picture on the cover of Forbes would mean more to me than seeing my son turn into the person I believe he can be.